Please take your Bible on this Palm Sunday. And we're going to talk about the triumphal entry of Jesus. And I'm going to assume that you already know the story. If you do not, here is the story. Jesus tells his disciples to go into a neighboring village as they are making their way toward entrance to Jerusalem. It is to become what we call the triumphal entry. And Jesus says, you'll find the colt of an ass tied up there. And if anybody says, what are you doing? You just simply say, the master hath need of this donkey and take it. And then when he rides into Jerusalem, the people greet him with great exuberation, exultation, saying, Hosanna, 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 and waving palm leaves as he enters the city. Now, there is a significance about his riding a donkey. If you look sometime at Exodus chapter 13, verse 13, which is a part of the Mosaic law, there was to be the taking of the life of the firstborn of your animals. But some animals are unclean. For example, a donkey is unclean. So you couldn't take that donkey, the firstborn of your herds, as an unclean animal, and offer it as a sacrifice. So according to Exodus chapter 13, if you wanted to keep the animal, the donkey, then you would have to sacrifice a lamb and the donkey's life would be spared. Otherwise, you were to break the neck of the donkey and kill it. So here we have a donkey. The donkey, obviously, is a worthless animal. It's the firstborn, or those men would not have been so willing to let it go. It could not be used. It should be killed. Here are some strangers that come to town and say, we'll take it off of your hands, and they're glad for that to happen instead of sacrificing a lamb. But it's significant because that donkey represents all of us. Because all of us, like that donkey, deserve to die an eternal death. But just as that donkey could have its life spared by the death of a lamb, now we have this donkey being ridden upon by the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world and who will die in a matter of days. So his life is spared by the eternal Lamb just as that ancient donkey had his life spared by a Lamb. It's very interesting. It's also interesting to note that in Zechariah chapter 9, verses 9 and 10, that King David rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, in his, quote-unquote, triumphal entry as king. So Jesus comes in to the applause of the great crowds that are along the roadway as he enters Jerusalem. They're so happy. Here's the king. They're excited. They're wanting to embrace him, to clap their hands, to wave their palm leaves, Everything would have been wonderful if the story had stopped right there. Everything would have been wonderful. But the story proceeds because they leave the wonder of Jesus and the glory and the happiness of Jesus, at least Matthew does, and notice what happens. In Matthew chapter 21, in verse 11, at the conclusion of this triumphal entry, the multitude said, this is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. Verse 12, immediately, the very next verse, and Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves and said unto them, it is written, my house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of feast. Now look at this side of Jesus. He goes from coming into the city on a donkey to wild applause, 
to immediately go to the religious place, the temple, the center of all religious activity in that day. And he looks at all of these religious people and says, you're not right with God at all. You need to repent. You need to turn to God. What you're doing is wrong. You're making the house of God into a den of thieves. Jesus went and preached a message of repentance, of sin and judgment to the religious crowd. He had also done it to his race. You'll notice in John chapter 1, he speaks to the Jews, to the nation of Israel. And the Bible says he came unto his own, that is to his own people, the nation of Israel. He came to his own, and his own received him not. Now listen to me. Every one of you listen to me. It's one thing to be a participant in the triumphal entry and to praise the Lord Jesus Christ on Palm Sunday. It's fitting that you do that. It's fitting that you do it next week when we celebrate Easter and his resurrection from the grave. It's fitting that you do that. When you talk about Jesus the babe born in Bethlehem, all of that's wonderful. It's wonderful that you have all of these wonderful services every Sunday in a church service somewhere. All of that is wonderful. But I have a question for you. If you were to go hear Jesus preach, do you think that you would hear a sermon from the lips of the Lord Jesus Christ that everybody would enjoy. Would it not be that the sermons that you would hear from the lips of Jesus would be different than the messages that you hear from the lips of the preachers in the average pulpit of all denominations in America on this Sunday their sermons will not be nearly, as to the point, stern and judgmental as those of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because just as Jesus enjoyed temporary popularity, the preacher who preaches the truth and hammers it home from the Word of God for a while, he will be popular. But eventually, his enemies, and he will have enemies in his city and maybe even in his church, will do everything that they can to destroy him and his ministry. Jesus was popular riding the donkey into the city. He was not popular with the religious people of the temple. He was not popular with the Jewish leadership when he said he came into his own and his own received him not. Let me just ask you this question. I want you to think about it a minute. Somewhere in the neighborhood of 3,000 people were tragically killed 9-11. Remember that? Tragically. Some 3,000 were killed. Now, we are told, we are told, and I think incorrectly, we are told to tone it down on preaching about judgmentalism, tone it down talking about death and the wages of sin being death, tone it down that there is only one way to heaven and that's by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You just need to tone that down. Just tone it down. What we need to do, they say, is to look people with a very non-offensive question and ask them, wouldn't you like to have an abundant life? Jesus wants to give you an abundant life. Wouldn't you like to come to Christ and have an abundant life? Now, all of that's true. It is true. But let's go back to those people that died on 9-11 when those evil men flew their planes into the Twin Towers. If you had had them in a church auditorium, 3,000 people. And let's just, I have no idea how many were lost. Surely there were people in there that were lost. 
Let's say 2,000 were lost out of the 3,000. She had all 3,000 in there the day before. And you had some sort of divine information from God that tomorrow all these people you're preaching to are going to die. What in the world would be the use of you looking at them and saying, God has a wonderful plan for your life? No, he doesn't have a wonderful plan. Tomorrow you're going to die. And some of you are going to jump out of that building 100 floors to the pavement. Some of you are going to burn up. I mean, it's not really going to be a wonderful life. Is that what you're going to tell them? Come on, come on. You had them there in front of you. What would you tell them? I'll tell you what you'd say. Folks, we're coming to the end of our lives even if we live another 40 or 50 years, are you ready to meet the Lord? Ultimately, whether it's today or tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, or a decade from now, you are going to die unless Jesus comes. You're either going to go to heaven or hell. And let me tell you about hell. Let me tell you about the horror of dying without Christ. That's what you'd tell them. And that's what Jesus did. And the people didn't like it. Hey, folks, that's true all the way through the Bible. The prophets were popular as long as they did prophecies that the king and the people wanted to hear. The moment they issued a prophecy that wasn't pleasant to the ears, they had to be destroyed. Starting in the Garden of Eden with Abel. There was Cain with all these beautiful fruits and vegetables and Abel, this bloody offering. He had to be killed. He had to be killed. Noah was disregarded. The people hated him. Go through the Bible, all the way through the Bible. Every time the prophets named them, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Daniel, and I could go on and on and on. They were popular. They had their own triumphal entries into Jerusalem until they told the truth that the people did not want to hear. Go into the New Testament. If the Old Testament is too hard and too judgmental for you, as some people say, look at the New Testament. Every single one of the apostles became martyrs except John. And John was thrown in a vat of boiling oil. And I think that was because that cruel emperor Diomitian of Rome wanted to get rid of him. You know, you know, I got to think about this the other day. I really got to think about this. Do you know why he didn't die in that pot of boiling oil? Because God had already had it in his heart for John to write the book of Revelation. He hadn't written it. So how could he die in a vat of boiling oil when he hadn't done everything that God wanted him to do? And I'm telling you, that's what my mother taught me about my own life. That's the reason I'm not worried about February when I'm nearly bled to death three times. I can't die until God's done with me. And I've done everything he wants me to do. Just can't do it. But don't you see, when the apostles told the truth, it was time to kill them. Look at Stephen, the first martyr. He, didn't, he told them the truth. And they stoned him. You are popular until you really start living for God. Because you see, here is the thing. The people who applauded Jesus with a triumphal entry, they wanted one thing, a Messiah, to get them out from under that hard yoke of the boot of Rome. Just free us from that and we'll be happy. May I tell you something? I'm convinced of it. I'm convinced of it. The vast majority of people, the vast majority of people in the church, the only thing they want from Jesus is to keep us out of hell and get us into heaven. They don't want Jesus messing up their lives every day and being Lord of their lives. They don't want to hear that kind of message. They just don't. Now, I believe there are many people that are hungry for Jesus. I really do. And the people that are hungry for Jesus 
are people that may not be the kind of people we would even want in our churches. Do you ever think about that? There are people out there that are hungry for Jesus that don't look what we think a Christian ought to look like nor sound like. Let me give you an example. Miller and I hardly ever go to movies. We just don't because we know there's going to be a curse in it. But somebody told us about a Christian movie called The Jesus Revolution. And I would encourage everybody listening to me, go see The Jesus Revolution, if it's still in the theaters, and I'm sure that it is. Because it's about what happened in the 70s. Let's just call it like it is. Young people came to Jesus by the tens of thousands starting in California that looked and dressed like hippies, but they had a heart for God. And it's a true story. It is a true story. It is a true story. And I suppose out of all the main characters, if there's one really main character, a hippie young man by the name of Lonnie Frisbee, and you'll see this in the film. He really has a heart for God. He has a hunger for God. And I'm not going to say what kind of sin he got into, but he got into a lot of sin, even after he was saved, after he was born again. And he got away from God. But thank God, before he died, he came back to God. But God used him mightily. And you scratch your head and say, how could God use somebody like that that's going to end up in his weakness, his frailty, and disappoint God, and break the heart of God, and sin? Well, I'll tell you why. It's obvious Lonnie Frisbee, the character in that movie, and I checked him out. I, I did everything I could study upon him. He really had a hunger for God. He really had a hunger for God. And what God wants, he's not somebody who's a gifted singer or a gifted Sunday school teacher. He's wanting somebody that is hungry for him. Not just for the denomination, not just for the perpetuity of your church. Your church has been around a long time. My daddy went to the church. My mama went to that church. My grandpa's went to church. It's got to be, it's got to be about having a real relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And if he looks at you and says something you're doing is wrong, that settles it. It is wrong and you're going to change. There's a group in America called Barma, and they study what's going on at churches. And I'm going to tell you, the influence of the church in America is going downhill. And I know we've got major churches, and they're out there, but the church in America is going downhill, and it's going downhill rapidly. They have four reasons that churches are losing their influence. Number one, because they're losing their focus. They're becoming a sort of a modern version, a religious version of the YMCA. They're more interested in softball teams and workout rooms and taking trips and eating on Friday night and having a lot of fun, taking the kids to Disney World than they are. As Peter Lord said, as Peter Lord said, and I like it, the church needs to make the main thing doing the main thing. But the problem, Peter Lord says, the people who ought to be making the main thing, the main thing, don't even know what the main thing is. But the church has lost its focus. Everything else is going on in the church. Except help, helping the church members to have an ear for whatever the Lord says. The second thing Barma says is the church is more interested in the things of the world than they are the things of heaven. That's right. That's right. And sometimes when we try to copy, quote unquote, the growing ministries in America and make ours like theirs, we are actually accepting what they've already accepted from the world as a model for how they can grow. The third thing, churches are losing their standards. I heard the other day, 
about a church with which I'm familiar and I've preached there. You walk into the lobby, they have the church covenant written on the wall. The pastor took it down because he doesn't think people ought to walk in and the very first thing they see is a bunch of rules. Well, I'm sorry, there are standards that ought to make a Christian person who's living for God different from the world. This is all right. You get out here and drink all you want at ball games or at the bars, just as long as you don't get drunk. That's what they say. It's all right to watch the R-rated movies. It's all right to dress like a prostitute. It's all right to use a little bad language. A church that I know about fired all the staff members. Big church. Do you know why? And one of the staff members was very upset. Because the church that had elders in its leadership went, collected the staff members' cell telephones, found out they had dirty jokes and cuss words on it, and fired the staff, which is what they ought to have done. But this staff member said, wait a minute. Brother Harold, you know how men talk when it's just men. Sure, we told some dirty stories and, and we used some cuss words. Now, I'm talking about a church that's recognized as a great church. But he couldn't understand it. He said, you know, all men do. I said, I don't. I don't. And the fourth thing that Barma said is we are so caught up on celebrity preachers. My preacher can preach better than yours and mine's better in the pulpit. We've gotten caught up on that. You know the recent Asbury University revival? Celebrity preachers started going to it wanting to offer their ministries and were offended when those students at Asbury looked at them and said, I'm sorry, we're not going to use your ministry. All we need to hear from is Jesus. Well, I say amen to that. But it's been that way in America. During the colonist period of the 1700s, the church was seeing a decline in attendance. So they started what's known as the halfway covenant. The halfway covenant was because in those days they baptized babies. Well, they didn't want to be in the church because of all the strict regulations of the church about a man not drinking and so forth and gambling. So what they said was this. You can be a part of the halfway group. You can do gambling and drinking. Just don't say much about it. And we'll let you come be a member of the church and your baby can be baptized. So you ended up in the church in the colonial period with two groups. Check it out. You have the old light and you had the new light. The new light were those of a halfway covenant. You could live any way you want to live, but still be a member of the church. The old light were those that were saying, wait a minute, wait just a minute. Are we going to live for God or are we not going to live for God? Well, put me down under the old light. But every once in a while, there would be a revival that would sweep in. And I, I could name a lot of them, but let me just give you something that you're not going to hear in the history books. Let me just explain it to you. In Kentucky, there was a region called Cane Ridge. I mean, Cane Ridge is out in the middle of nowhere. There was a very famous movement of God at Cane Ridge that went on Week after week after week. And I mean, they didn't have any restaurants. They didn't have any bathrooms. They didn't have any places for comfort there. No, no holiday inns. I mean, we're talking back in the 1842-45 period. But they were having 25,000 people. No microphones. No slick singers. A lot of praying. A lot of praying going on. And a lot of preaching. At the Cane Ridge Revival. 25,000 people came. 25,000. The Civil War comes along 20 years later. That revival had had so many people saved who had gone out and reached other people to the Lord. The Civil War had 620,000 soldiers to die in battle, both north and south. 
Here's something you won't read in the history books. At least, almost half of them, 300,000 claimed to be saved either directly or indirectly as a result of that Cane Ridge revival. And it was a revival that emphasized holy living. See, we don't do that anymore. And, and just as the people turned on Jesus, oh, Jesus, if you'll just come and be our king, that's what, but we don't want you, we don't want you telling us how to live. We just want you to the Messiah and get rid of Rome. Most church members nowadays in all denominations, they want just enough religion, just enough Jesus to get them into heaven and to keep them out of hell. They don't want Jesus in their lives every day. They just simply don't. And I want to say something to you. You know one of the ways that you can tell that somebody means business, either as a politician or a preacher or an industrialist or whatever it is. It's because they're going to try to wipe him out, destroy him, get rid of him. That's what they want to do with Jesus. A few days after applauding him, they kill him. We can't put up with somebody telling us how to live. You don't think it happens nowadays? Look at Martin Luther King. And I'm going to tell you this. If you think he was a great speaker, you ought to heard some of his sermons. I've had a chance. He was a great preacher. And what he said made sense. But they got rid of him. They killed him. They killed him. I mean, listen. You can tell, you can tell whether a man is going to make a difference or a woman's going to make a difference by whether they continue to be popular or whether they are subject to this kind of talk. Well, I know they're doing a great job, but let me tell you what I know. Now, I mean, you know, I just, I'm, I, can't, I, I can't support them. You know, I learned that early on. I went into the ministry when I was 17 years old. The very first church I went into, I had a major problem as a 17-year-old. And you know who helped pull me out? Some bootleggers. They told a particular deacon, we love that young preacher. He comes to the grocery store and drinks RC colas and eat moon pies with us on Saturday afternoon. No preacher's ever done that. We don't want him run off. And I didn't get run off. So we've been praying for Jerry Robinson. Jerry would tell you this if he was here. He loved to drink. He loved to gamble. I've heard him talk about gambling as one of the big businessmen in McMinnville, Tennessee. And they'd gamble 24, 48, 72 hours. And he said, I, I can remember taking $100 bills, raking them off the table with my bare feet holding them to the floor. And then he came to the Lord. Well, how did he come to the Lord? And his wife came. I won't go into it and had me to come. And he'd run many preachers off. And he looked at me as a lost man, lost businessman. He said, I love to sell beer, make a lot of money at it. And I love to drink it. If I get saved, can I keep drinking and selling it? I said, listen, if you get saved and it's all right with God, it's all right with me. He said, that's a good deal. He came down the aisle the following Sunday. No, Monday was was um, was selling beer again. Boy, my deacons raked me over the coast. Can I tell you something? When God brings a real honest revival into a church or a community, it's going to be messy. You're going to have these hippie people like Lonnie Frisbee out there in California. It's not going to be a neat little packaged revival meeting like the Southern Baptist Convention in some back room had some seminary kooks put together. 
When the Holy Ghost gets involved, it's going to be messy. Well, it was messy. Till on Friday, he came to my office and said, if I hadn't gotten saved last Sunday, I'd cuss you out. You know that if I got saved, you knew that, that I couldn't ever drink or sell it again. And Jerry began to bring people to the Lord. And the deacons got angry over it. I mean, they got angry. Who is this guy? Jerry decided he wanted Marilyn and I to go to Israel. She started taking up money. He even went to the boot, lady bootlegger in that town by the name of Pokey Barnes. Can you imagine that? And she said, whatever's well, in the jug over there that I took in today, you can have it. And the deacons came down to his store and said, you, you got to let us have the money. He said, I'm going to let you have that money. Well, that's our pastor. He said, well, he's that pastor, but he's my friend. He's the one that led me to the Lord. <laughs> I'm the one taking up the money. I'll take care of it. See, when God does a work, it's not always going to be neat. It may get messy. It may get messy. I remember at the First Baptist Church of Etowah, which not had a conservative preacher maybe in 40 or 50 years until they called me. That's a whole different story. And I went there. And we put in a prayer room that you could go to and pray and seek the face of God. And God began to work. And on one Sunday morning, about two months after I was there, we had 27 saved, adults saved, and 14 red rededications and 10 or 11 joined the church that day. And one deacon looked at another out in the lobby, I found out later, and said, this has got to be of the devil. We've never had anything like this happen here. He got messy. He really got messy. See, you'll have people that say, we want to have a revival, but boy, when a revival comes, they're not sure they want to have it. And yet some of the greatest, most godly people that ever lived that I ever met anywhere were at First Baptist Church of Etowah and at, and at Northside Baptist Church in McMinnville where I met Jerry Robinson. Because you know what? You know what I've discovered? There are more people in the church that really do hunger for God they just don't know how to get that hunger satisfied than there are the naysayers and the skeptics. Uh, let me just give you an example. The last church, North Jacksonville. It's located on Pearl Street. <clears throat> and um, there was no parking. I mean, no parking. We were having three services on a Sunday morning building would seat about 1200 and cars lined up three and four and five blocks and people were afraid especially for a night service to park out there so we had a problem we tried buying houses couldn't do that we tried to build a parking garage city wouldn't give us zoning on it so we talked and talked and talked and finally it looks like well we're going to have to relocate and so one of our members car dealer there, a man by the name of Joe Behrman said, I found a spot I think, I think we ought to consider moving. It's the place where North Jacksonville are located. I went out there and I got on my knees and prayed about it. Went to the man that owned the property and he said, I'm really not interested in selling it, but I tell you if you'll uh, if you give me $50,000 earnest money, which means you've got to come up with the other amount of money, which would be $1.1 million. If you come up with it, it's yours. If you don't come up with it in 60 days, the $50,000 is mine. So I talked to the treasurer, and the treasurer said, well, we got $50,000, and we did, and we wrote a check for $50,000 earnest money. So then we go to the church, and, and you say, well, why did you do that before you went to church? Because the owner was getting ready to sell that land. I didn't have time to call a church meeting 
unless they gave him the $50,000. And I believed it enough, and the treasurer of the church believed it enough that we gave him the 50000 because we didn't want somebody else to get it. So we called a church meeting. I, there must have been eight or 900 people there on a Wednesday night. And we were moving along about going to have a ballot vote and a sweet little, I call her a Mrs. Santa Claus, Zelma Apple, who was a sharp tax preparer, very sharp woman in her 80s. And she loved me to death. Stood up and said, Brother Hunter, how much money do we owe right now? Well, the previous pastor had built a building there on that present site. I looked at everybody and I said, $800,000. Brother Hunter, how much money do we have in the bank? I said, we only have one account. I think we got $124 because the treasurer and I gave the owner of the land $50,000 earnest money. We did have $50,124. We got $124. Brother Hunter, how much money do we have in the building fund? I said, none, because we haven't set up a building fund. She said, okay, now let me understand this right. We only have $124 in the bank. <laughs> no building fund. And we owe $800,000. And the land is going to cost a little over $1,100,000. And then we've got to build a building on top of that, several million dollars. Is that right? And I thought, this thing is going to die like a, like a dead duck over a swamp. It's going down. And then she looked at me and said, you believe that that's what God wants? I said, I do, Granny Apple. That's what I believe. She said, well, I do too. She said, now, folks, I know money. I know money. But our preacher knows the Lord. And if our preacher says we need to do that, I'd be willing to follow him into the fire of hell wearing gasoline underwear if this thing's of God. <laughs> well, there's some people didn't like that. But we took a secret ballot vote that night, and it was 86% in favor of making the move. And the church would have died if it hadn't happened. Up until then, my ministry had been without danger at all. No hardships. But the minute you start acting on what God wants instead of what you want and doing things God's way instead of the way you want it done, you are asking for trouble. We had a very popular television ministry. Every Sunday night, Arbitron Rating said it was the number one rated television ministry of a religious nature in the city. And for so several Sunday nights, I preached on moral challenges in Jacksonville. I preached about beer and I named companies that provided it and sold it. Hospitals that did abortions and called it murder and hotels and organizations that catered to the homosexual crowd. One Saturday night after that series was concluded, the doorbell rang and my yard was filled with police cars. Somebody had taken a contract out on my life. They said, we need you to wear a bulletproof vest when you preach because we've been told that there will be an effort to kill you on television in front of your people. For several weeks after that, I wore a bulletproof vest and had a police guard 24 hours a day at my office and at my home. My wife was threatened to be sexually assaulted, our kids kidnapped. Let me just say this to you. I could have remained popular. But I can't remain popular if I do what Jesus says. At one time, I was very, very popular as a preacher in the Southern Baptist Convention until I said at a convention in Florida that I had checked with the maids and the bellboys at hotels and taxi drivers. 
And out of all the thousands of preachers and staff members and deacons that were at the convention, I had not found one single bellboy or maid that a preacher or one of the messengers to the convention of church member had said one word to them about being saved. Couldn't find a one. And I said to them, you let some Jehovah's Witnesses hit this town, they'll talk to everybody. And here we have the gospel, and we won't even share it. I was criticized harshly by Baptist papers for having said something like that. How dare him to humiliate our men and women of God. It's not a humiliation. It's the truth. I mean, Jesus said, for the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And even as the Father has sent me, even so send I you. He didn't just send me to win people to the Lord in the field where I pastor. If you're a pastor, thank God for that. But if you're on vacation and you live in Pascagoula, Mississippi, but you're in Sacramento, California, and you'll never see that person again. But if God touches your heart, you to talk to him about the Lord. See, that's what it means to live under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You do what he wants you to do, when he wants you to do it. Do you understand that? I was holding a great crusade in the state of Alabama. Big, huge crusade. And I don't know, scores and scores and scores of people being saved. And one of the pastors who had underestimated the power of God, not the persuasive Harold Hunter, Harold Hunter, but the power of God didn't like what he saw going on and started having meetings with the pastors to try to discourage them from participating in the meeting. I know what it is. I know what it is. Jesus went to the religious crowd and they didn't like him. I'm going to tell you, there are a lot of people in the religious crowd don't like me. In fact, after I left North Jacksonville Baptist Church, one of the leaders said, I'll see to it. You never preach in this church again or in the city of Jacksonville. Well, I've never preached there, but I do preach in Jacksonville. After all, that's where Son Baptist is located. Isn't it a shame that when you decide to live for God, you have to know the devil's going to try to destroy you? Now, you're not a preacher. You're a layman. Your triumphal entry was when you were saved. And everybody in the church was glad that you were saved. And they came by and they welcomed you and patted you on the back and hugged you. That was your triumphal entry. But it doesn't stop there. Just like Jesus went to the temple and challenged those religious people. If you're going to live for God, even as a layman, you're going to have to challenge some of your friends. Some of the people you go to church with. Some of the people that at one time applauded you when you were saved. And you're going to lose them as friends. You're going to have to challenge this world. We've got a cancel culture. You know what that is. If you're not exactly what a group wants you to be, they're going to do everything they can to cancel you. But you'll lose your influence. Nobody's going to like you. They're going to ostracize you. You won't be a part of them anymore. May I tell you? I've learned something. The day I wake up and I think, life is good, life is wonderful. I can't think of any problems I've got. That's the day I'll know I've backslidden. If I'm living for Jesus, just like he fought the devil and fought opposition every day of his ministry, 
I ought to be doing that too. I've told you the story before, but you need to hear it again. John Wesley, a strong preacher of righteousness and judgment, was riding along on horseback one day, and he was grieving because nobody had criticized him. Absolutely nobody had criticized him for two weeks. And he was feeling as though he had failed to God. About that time, a man stepped out from behind a tree with a big rock. This man, he found out later his wife had been saved in a Wesley meeting, and this man didn't like it. So he took that rock and threw it as hard as he could and knocked Wesley off his horse. When Wesley picked himself up and dusted himself off, he yelled with glee, Hallelujah, I'm back in fellowship with God. Jesus made that triumphal entry. Everybody loved him until he began to interfere with the way they ran their lives. What about you? Are you going to do what he says? Are you going to joyfully serve him? And more than that, when you're criticized, about your love of the Lord Jesus Christ and your determination to serve him and have standards for your life that are holy and godly. Are you going to cave into the world or continue to live for him? I hope you'll live for him. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>